So good, good morning and welcome all. I can take this off now that we have the protection here so there is no, no risk. I'm pleased to open this session and uh, let me read just a very few notes just to be sure that we do open and uh, rightly celebrate the 21st anniversary of uh, this convention. So thank you and welcome. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased and honored to welcome you all to this conference by which we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the UNIDRA Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects. We are very appreciative of the willingness of all of you to support this conference. The speakers and participants gathered here in Rome or connected from all over the world by web, and I understand that we have 400 people enrolled for this, uh, for this conference, are drawn from all relevant sites of this, of this dossier. We have scholars, practitioners, authorities, and adjudicators which in my understanding is also an extremely good result. I was, of course, not president of UNIDRA when the convention was negotiated and adopted, but I know that several persons who did participate in this adventure are with us today, and they bear witness to the obstacles that had to be overcome and to the need to reach an agreement on the recovery of stolen or illegally exported cultural objects. As I said, I was not president, I was in fact still a student at the time, but I did study and read all articles, so I'm absolutely aware of all the dynamics behind this, uh, this convention. We also have with us people who helped having states ratify this convention and showed continuous interest for this instrument and supported its use. A, word, a warm welcome to all of, all, to all of you. Let us also take this opportunity to welcome in particular Mr. Benani Lemrabot, Minister of Culture of Mauritania, who honors us with his presence today, so as the ambassadors in Italy of Afghanistan, Eritrea, and Mongolia, and other representatives of states. I name with the hope I'm not forgetting anyone. I know I have Italy, Mexico, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, Poland, Spain, Czech Republic, at least among you. Also, I welcome representatives of other international organizations present today, our partners in the fight against illicit traffic in cultural objects, and in particular, the Director General of ICROM, ICESCO, and ICOM. So, as the Assistant Director General for Culture of UNESCO and the Coordinator of the Works of Art Unit at Interpol. I wish to thank them and their organizations for the constant and strong support given to UNIDRA and its 1995 convention since the very beginning. The 1925 convention is the result of our extremely fruitful cooperation. The fight against illicit trafficking of cultural objects is not only a priority or a mere political commitment, it is also a collective responsibility. Illicit trafficking of cultural property is a scourge that is constantly expanding and taking on, on new forms. The civilized world can no longer tolerate this despoilment. The civilized world cannot remain indifferent to these offenses. The civilized world cannot allow important artistic and cultural testimony to our roots, the roots of humanity, of the whole world, steadily to be destroyed and fragmented. The 25th anniversary of the 1995 Convention provides an opportunity to assess the significance, the distinctive feature and the operational aspects of this normative instrument and its interaction with others, including the 1970 UNESCO Convention, the European Instruments and the Nicosia Convention. We will treat and we'll discuss all of these topics during this two days conference. It is important in this context to acknowledge that essential rules are already in place and that focus is now required in ensuring that they are better known and applied. On behalf of UNIDRA, 
I would like to thank you all for having come to Rome or for following from all around the world under these difficult circumstances to bring your invaluable contribution and bearing witness to the great interest generated by this initiative. Thank you. I wanted to read this, this sentence, also I'm not used to read, just to be sure that I convey the right message to all of you. So really, thanks a lot. And now I think I can just leave the, give the floor to all other people that will uh, give us uh, their welcome from the, other, from the other organization. I will now give the floor to Roberto Riccardi. Brigadier General Commander of the Carabinieri Command for the Protection of Cultural Heritage of Rome, who speaks on behalf of, the, of Dario Franceschini, who is the Minister of Cultural Heritage and Activities and Tourism of Italy. So please, General Riccardi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it's an honor to, for me to be here and uh, celebrate this uh, happy birthday. I uh, thank you the best wishes and uh, regards on the behalf of uh, Italian Minister Dario Franceschini, who couldn't uh, intervene because of the well-known uh, emergency and asked me to represent him. A couple of days ago, I went and visited uh, Villa Farnesina, where the scientists have just found out that the painter Raffaello in his masterpiece Il Trionfo di Galatea used the ancient, distant, and expensive color called the Egyptian blue. Now it will be up to the historians to figure it out how this color allegedly disappeared much prior than Raffaello went up to him. It will be hard for them, but maybe the reason is very simple. Art has wings. It can fly and let us fly. Unfortunately, illicit trafficking of cultural goods as well spread all over the world. They don't stop at national borders. This is why the UNIDRAC Convention created to integrate the UNESCO one is so important. Just think of the due diligence, which has become an international parameter on the evaluation of the requirements to determine good faith in the purchase of a cultural property, the reversal of the burden of proof, the time limits for the restitution actions of the most relevant cultural objects, the provisions regarding illicit excavations and archaeological assets. For police officers, such as Italian Carabinieri for the protection of cultural heritage, all these tools are fundamental. Today, the convention has 48 contracting states, 10 of which have exceeded in the last three years. This uh, relevant increase is due to the continuous diplomatic work of UNIDRA and Italy, which is the depository country of the convention. We live uh, in troubled times, today more than ever, and for many reasons, but the threat to cultural heritage is still at its peak. The ratification is a necessary step for the defense of world heritage and the fines fight against the illicit trafficking. The more countries adopt it, the less space there will be for the shadows which have always surrounded the art market. After the French Revolution and during the Napoleon campaigns, the art theorist Catromer de Quincy wrote about the place where we are now, Rome. The Eternal City is a very special diffuse museum composed of statues, temples, obelisks, columns, fragments, but in the meantime, also made up of ancient cultural connections among objects, memories, and local tradition still in use, which are not truly understandable if you don't experience and compare them in first person, exploring the place itself. The UNIDRA Convention helps beauty to come back. Art has not only wings, it has soul and roots. It wants to live where it was created. Thank you very much. Mm. 
Thanks a lot, Generale Riccardi. Now we have uh, on the web the Director General of uh, ICROM, Weber Ndoro. I give the floor to him so we can, we should see him on video. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Here, uh, honorable ministers, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here with you to represent ICROM. And I would like to thank our colleagues and friends at UNIDUA for organizing this very important event and to share some thoughts with you. World events in recent years have led to a greater awareness of the importance of safeguarding cultural heritage, particularly in areas where conflicts and disasters have the most serious wounds and where inter intergovernmental organizations work. I would want to thank UNESCO and also greet my friend, Mr. Ernesto Ramirez, also ESCO, uh, the, the Director General who is also present with us. Other international organization, ICOM, and also the president who addressed us this morning. I'm also aware that the president of ICOMOS, Mr. Kono, will also address us at some point. We know the important role of Italy in this field, as evidenced already by the presence at the table of the Carabinieri, who are representing the Minister of Culture, Minister Franceschini. All the events of recent years, together with the most recent COVID-19 uh, pandemic, although not directly linked to each other, have been the background of a complex geopolitical evolution, which is still underway and is profoundly changing the political balance on a global level, and at the same time offers important opportunities. As we all know, ICROM was created as a resolution of the UNESCO General Assembly of 1956 in New Delhi to form a forum for the collection and sharing of knowledge and to support the conservation of cultural heritage, which at that time was heavily damaged during the Second World War. Today, the organization's mission has evolved to include the relationship with natural environment and communities, but also the deepening of the very concept of cultural heritage, the vital needs for communities to be included and engage in heritage conservation has led to a shift towards a broader idea of capacity building. Here, I think of the recent events or some of the recent events like the Black Lives Matter, which in turn has an impact on the safeguarding and managing of cultural heritage on the repatriation of cultural property, on the looting of cultural property, and also the illicit trade which comes with that. The need for this expansion becomes more and more pertinent when one considers that the destruction and looting of heritage has become a distinct aspect of our contemporary life. And that also includes the stealing, the looting, the illicit trade, which, is, which has become rampant in today's world, again, fueled by some of the conflicts and some of the pandemics in the world. The position of Ukraine has already been expressed in various situations. The Sharjah Declaration on the occasion of the Symposium on Preservation of Cultural Heritage in Times of Crisis adopted by the Ministers of Culture of the Arab States at the beginning of 2015 recalls the importance to promote cooperation between Arab states and regional organizations facing the challenges arising from ongoing conflicts and to invite them to review current policies relating to heritage management and protection in crisis situation. As early as January 2018, at the meeting of European Ministers of Culture in Davos, ICROM stressed that Europe should interact with other regions of the world to share strategies 
and good examples of high quality bioculture. And by proposing ICROM as a privileged forum to allow continuous exchanges at the international level. ICROM is particularly involved in the development of on-site professional training from prevention through the excavation of movable artifacts to a safe place, the sheltering of buildings it and, all, and so on, to the documentation of damaged artifacts. The most recent efforts related to the current crisis in Beirut reminds us of the need to be vigilant all the time. This brings us to the need for strong considerations of the importance of consolidating and supporting effective coordination. And here, I would like to mention the initiative carried by Ikrom Sharjah Regional Center in October 2018 on improving legislations and the institutional framework of cultural heritage protection. And this was in partnership with UNIDWA, Interpol, and UNESCO. Together with international experts, they were able to examine the current situation of the management of legislation and institutional heritage uh, institutional arrangement of heritage in the region and identify the challenges of its protection management and priority areas of intervention. This included strengthening institutional capacity, the institutional and legal frameworks, and also international cooperation. I think it is very important to understand the values of cultural heritage. It is also important to understand the values of objects of cultural importance. These also touch on others who may appear to have different views than ours. And above all, we need to act differently in different situations. In this framework, we thank the collaboration of UNIDWA and we look forward to further consolidation of our collaboration for the future. We are honored to be here to celebrate with you the 25th anniversary of the 1995 convention. We wish you a successful event and I thank all of you. Thank you, the Director General of ICROM, Weber Ndoro. Now I give the floor to Mr. Salim Al Malik. Director General of ICESCO, who also will speak is, uh, with us through the through the web. Please, you have the floor. Good word. If you want. To Thank you, me. President Fionidra, Professor Maria Chiara Malagotti, Excellencies, Head of International Bodies and Organization, Distinguished Participant. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to express my sincerest appreciation to Professor Maria Sharad Maragoti, President of the UNIDRA for her kind invitation. I also take this opportunity to, to congratulate her on her recent appointment as the President of this important institute. I wish her every success and her new responsibilities. It is with a great honor to be part of this international webinar and celebrating the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the Unidrought Convention on stolen or illegally exported cultural object. Cultural heritage is faced with the grave threats, mainly with theft and looting. Lacking social awareness, our heritage has found its way into auction houses and has become exposed to sale on social media. We see more illicit trafficking on cultural property now becoming more sophisticated by the use of modern technology. The international community is aware of the seriousness of this crime since the second half of the last century and took serious steps towards developing an international legal framework for the, for the protection of cultural property. These endeavors culminated first in the adoption of the, 90, the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit, import, the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property 50 years ago. Drawing in this conference, the international community adopted the New Drought Convention on a stolen or legally exported cultural object in 1995. 
Despite all these efforts deployed, crime against heritage continue to rise. They have turned into one of the funding sources of tourism and became synonymous with money laundering. As a consequence, it is hard to measure the scale of the crime ad, ad, and its impact in economies and public institutions. It is considered to be one of the most organized crime in the world, unfortunately. The challenge facing national legislation today lies in internet marketing and auction houses emerging on a daily basis on social network. It is mandatory that international community took, look for innovative means in developing and supporting legislation with commitment to implementation and intensify efforts to handling cultural heritage. We at the Islamic World Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, ISISCO, established through its Islamic Heritage, through its Islamic World Heritage Center, a special unit to provide our aid to our member and non-member state to restitute the looted heritage and cultural property. We also set up a special unit to utilize artificial intelligence technology and application in heritage fields. This will contribute to put up a mechanism to counter such a crime, safeguard heritage sites and museum items and expose illicit trafficking oper operation. Moreover, we recognize the importance of training technical professional, believing this is one of the measures to curb illicit trafficking. It is our priority to safeguard and preserve heritage. Thus, we allocated one million US dollars to restoring museum items of 30 member states, we have announced the support to, to support the restoration of heritage sites and museum in both Lebanon and Sudan, following Beirut explosion and Khartoum floods by donating 100,000 US dollars to each country. As part of our commitment and partnership with Unit Route, we will do our, our best to ask our member state that are not yet member to join the 1995 in drought convention stolen or really illegally exported cultural object. On, the, on 28 July 2020, ISISCO also organized a virtual conference under the theme of compacting illicit trafficking of cultural property and institution. Finally, conflict and war had an incalculable on cultural heritage with, with subsequent looting and theft in their wake. Artifact and antiquities are being trafficked from the origin country to the country where they are sold illegally. It is ironic and shameful. To say the least, the children of our generation and their children's children would only learn about their own countries heirlooms being showcased in another country and elsewhere. It is not only our duty to stop the illicit trafficking of heritage items, but ensuring as well that countries are proud of them wherever they are located. Cultural heritage is a jewel that can only shine where it truly belongs. I close my speech quoting Nelson Mandela, the great leaders, when he said, our rich and varied cultural heritage has, profound, has a profound power to help build our nation. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Al Malik, the Director General of ICESCO. We move to Dr. Corrado Catesi, Works and of Art Unit Coordinator of Interpol. Thank you. Ms. President, thank you for giving the floor. Excellencies, esteemed colleagues, on behalf of Interpol and on behalf of my Secretary General, Mr. Jürgen Stock, allow me to begin by congratulating UNIDRUA on the great efforts to put forward in contrasting the illicit traffic of cultural heritage. The convention we are celebrating today has achieved over these 25 years incredible results in this complex field. It is recognized worldwide as a major legal tool that we, as Interpol, encourage all our member countries to adopt. Interpol 
has been fighting the illicit traffic of cultural property on behalf of law enforcement worldwide since 1946. In this endeavor, we cooperate closely with our partner organizations. And I'm honored to say that UNIDROA is one of them. Our efforts in protecting cultural heritage focus on the core of the Interpol's mandate, the collection and exchange of vital information across borders through our stolen works of art database. Here, I would like to mention that also our database celebrates this year its 25th anniversary and the connection between our most important instrument and the UNIDROA convention is stronger than ever. These two major tools and their synergy when combined together are fundamental in preventing and contrasting the traffic of cultural property. Therefore, it is not coincidence that we, since the creation of the database, have always been developing new ways to facilitate the application of due diligence. We have opened our database to the public in 29 to allow everyone to fulfill their due diligence as required by the convention. The mobile application we have recently developed also makes it easier for buyers to check our register of stolen works of art. In closing, I would like to reiterate Interpol's commitment to work closely with UNIDROA and our long-standing partner organizations. The illicit traffic of cultural property strongly damages our collective heritage as a humankind, and our fight is not over yet. Cultural heritage is a piece of our common history for which we have the utter responsibility to protect and safeguard from the greed of criminals and from terrorist attack. Allowing me to thank you again for inviting Interpol to such an important event and celebration. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Catesi from Interpol. Now I give the floor or I show uh, the video of uh, Ernesto Ottone Ramirez, Assistant Director General for Culture from UNESCO. Je suis heureux de célébrer avec vous les 25 ans de la Convention d'Unidroit sur les biens culturels volés ou illicitement exportés. Cet anniversaire prend d'autant plus de sens dans la période exceptionnelle que nous vivons. Car malheureusement, le trafic illicite des biens culturels, le troisième commerce illégal mondial après les stupéfiants et les armes, s'est accéléré ces derniers mois avec la pandémie. La surveillance des sites archéologiques et des musées s'est en effet parfois desserrée et les trafiquants en ont profité. C'est précisément pour lutter contre ce fléau qui prive des peuples de leurs histoires que la Convention Unidroit existe. Depuis son adoption en 1995, elle est venue compléter la Convention de l'UNESCO de 1970, en particulier sur les questions de droits privés et des restitutions de biens. Mais nous le savons, peut-être pleinement efficace, ces deux conventions nécessitent d'être ratifiées le plus largement possible, car leur efficacité dépend directement de leur universalité. Ces règles n'auront cependant de sens que si elles sont suivies par la mise en œuvre de politiques concertées. Cette année 2020 est donc l'occasion de nous fixer des objectifs communs et ambitieux. Être ambitieux, c'est tout d'abord mieux identifier les priorités, région par région, de la lutte contre les trafics. Ce sera l'objet des conférences régionales en ligne que l'UNESCO organisera ces prochains mois. Être ambitieux, c'est aussi pousser une utilisation généralisée des modèles de certificats d'exportation pour que les ventes soient plus claires et bien sûr transparentes. C'est également soutenir la création de forces spécialisées en la matière, en renforçant la veille sur Internet notamment. Être ambitieux, c'est aussi renforcer notre coopération avec le marché de l'art en menant un travail de veille et de surveillance de toutes les ventes impliquant des biens culturels. C'est grâce à ce type de contrôle que nous conduisons avec nos États membres que nous avons pu récemment suspendre d'importantes ventes de biens illégalement sortis de Tunisie ou du Guatemala. Dans le même temps, nous devons continuer à former des professionnels de la culture et des forces de police 
pour soutenir nos États membres. Nous savons que nous pouvons compter sur nos partenaires que je voudrais une nouvelle fois remercier. Unidroit, bien sûr, mais aussi les carabiniers italiens, Interpol, le Conseil international des musées et l'Organisation mondiale des douanes. La lutte contre le trafic illicite passe enfin par la sensibilisation des potentiels acheteurs et plus généralement du grand public. C'est pour cette raison que nous lançons dans quelques jours une campagne mondiale de sensibilisation qui visera ces publics prioritaires. Toucher le plus grand nombre sera aussi l'ambition de la première journée internationale de lutte contre le trafic illicite des biens culturels le 14 novembre prochain pour le 50e anniversaire de la Convention de 1970. Cette année 2020, exceptionnelle sous bien des aspects, est donc l'occasion unique de se mobiliser pour le patrimoine. À cet égard, on ne peut que saluer le programme dense de conférences prévu par Unidroit pour ce 25e anniversaire. Il ne fait aucun doute que ces débats entre universitaires, archéologues, juristes ou acteurs publics feront ressortir des pistes de réflexion et d'action très nécessaires. Je voudrais donc, pour conclure, vous souhaiter une bonne conférence et bien sûr, un bel anniversaire. So sorry for this inconvenience on the, on the translation of the video of uh, Mr. Ottono Ramirez. Uh, now we have the last one, which is a, again a video, <laughs> the video of uh, Alberto Garlandini, president of ECOM. Please. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be with you today to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the 1995 UNIDRA Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects. Culturally and diplomatically, this commemoration is a significant occasion to remember the work that has been done up to now and to stress the need for continuous cooperation at international level to protect cultural heritage. Looking around the globe right now, it is easy to see why every actor involved in cultural property protection dedicates resources, efforts and energy to preserve the cultural heritage of the world, most particularly the object at risk. The current humanitarian, economic, sanitary crisis shows that every country needs to strengthen the means to mitigate risks and protect cultural heritage. The museum community has a key role in facing such challenges. The fight against illicit trafficking of cultural property is certainly one of the most difficult and complex. Illicit traffic is international, so the answer need to be international. The action taken by ICON are numerous. They are possible thanks to the ICOM network, composed of 49,000 museum professionals and institutions from 140 countries. Thanks to the dedication and knowledge of these experts, ICOM has created effective tools and technical, scientific and ethical standards that are acknowledged all over the world. Firstly, I would like to highlight the ICOM Code of Ethics for Museums. The code is recognized by UNESCO as a main international standard of museum practice and heritage management, and it includes disposition on acquisition and documentation. Secondly, I will point out the ICOM Red List published since 2000 and recognized as an efficient tool to help police and custom officers from around the globe identify objects that are illegally crossing borders and are on sale online through auction houses or antiquities dealers. 
The ICOM red lists have proven successful in the past as well as recently. I'm pleased to highlight they are used by the Italian Carabinieri for the seizure of a sculpture depicting a mother goddess which was returned to Iraq last July. ICOM tools are part of a whole. They are interdependent of all the other initiatives developed by our partners to fight the illicit traffic of cultural heritage. The key word to combat illicit traffic is cooperation. We need more and more global cooperation. ICOM has sized and will continue to size any occasion to recall the need to ratify and implement the existing international conventions, such as the 1970 UNESCO Convention and of course the 1995 UNIDROA Convention. These are the two main pillars of an operational fight against illicit trafficking. During these two days of celebration, we will listen to the accounts of experts on the impact of the 1995 Convention, on the essential concept of due diligence, as well as on the evolution of the legal framework related to the circulation of cultural objects. Each tool, each action, and each initiative complement each other. To conclude, let me once again remember that only thanks to effective international cooperation with museums, with UNIDRA, with UNESCO, with law enforcement agencies such as the World Custom Organization and Interpol, and with our relevant bodies, can we contribute to protect and conserve our shared cultural heritage around the world. Our experts have formed strong professional ties, and I wish that these excellent relationships between our organizations will continue and be strengthened in the future. Once again, congratulations to ONIDRA for this conference and for decades of efforts for cultural property protection worldwide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I really thank all of our colleagues of the other international organizations or institutions that uh, came here in person that gave us keynote speech in streaming alive or took the time to register a video when they knew they could not be present at this time. Thanks a lot for their messages uh, and uh, for their wishes. I also have to acknowledge and apologize because we mentioned the ambassador that are in the room, but I understand there are other ambassadors that are connected by web and at, at least in my for for what i understand we have the ambassador of syria at unesco we have the ambassador of senegal the ambassador of haiti and the ambassador of mauritania of course if we are missing someone please tell us from the chat because we will absolutely acknowledge your not only your presence but also the fact that you are with us which is of extreme relevance for us so i'm sorry because we didn't have the full list of people who are connected but there are many people in fact we have really a lot and please let us know because all of us want of course to greet and thank you for being present even if by web in those difficult times. I also, of course, take the welcome, not only of the president of UNIDRA, but of the whole group. We have our secretary general with us, Ignacio Tirado. The deputy secretary general was not allowed to be in. <laughs> She's uh, above uh, the second floor because we are too many in this room, but Anna Veneziano is following us by, by web also all the other people in the room and of course Marina Schneider that you all know because she's the one who organized everything so we all thank you and welcome you here. We finish with the 
first part of celebration and we get to the real uh, discussion of the so before opening the session the various session i can introduce uh, Professor Toshiyuki Kono, who is the Executive Vice President and Distinguished Professor at Kyushu University, he is President of ICOMOS, of ICOMOS. I see that my friend Garlandini prefers to pronounce the name of the, of the organization in English and not in Italian, as I was doing until now. The title of this uh, keynote speech is Impact of Uniform Laws on the Protection of Cultural Property on the 1995 Convention. I think I can in the, give the floor to him by connecting him. I see Professor Kono. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, so you have the floor for this keynote speech. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Madam President of UNIDROA, Professor Maria Chiara Malagati, Malaguti, Excellencies, dear participants, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to deliver this um, small speech to celebrate the 25th anniversary of 1995 UNIDROA Convention. This is the outline, very simple outline of my uh, uh, speech today. To begin with, I would like to mention um, my, Professor Lindel Prott, who took um, an initiative to um, produce this important uh, convention. And Professor Prott gave, um, gave lectures the Hague Academy of International Law, and it was published as Problems of Private International Law for the Protection of the Cultural Heritage in 1989. And this is one of the representative academic works in this field, and it was um, one of the pioneer works. 25 years later, I had an honor to give also lectures at the same Hague Academy of International Law. The topic that I chose for my lectures was efficiency in private international law. And in this lecture, I also spoke about the uniform law and private international law. Is uniform law more desirable than private international law? Today, we have eminent speakers in the field of cultural heritage law. So please allow me to speak from the viewpoint of private international law. And I would like to approach 1995 convention as the uniform law. 1995 convention is technically speaking the only uniform law in private, uniform private law in the field of cultural heritage. So I'd like to um, apply my uh, arguments in the lecture at the universe uh, at the Hague Academy of International Law to 1995 convention. In this lecture uh, in, in 2013, I propose not to take the categorical approach that the uniform law is always desirable than private international law, rather, we should analyze pros and cons, which scheme is more appropriate. And I emphasize that important is not only the costs, but also benefits, which could be brought about uniformity, which, can be, which could be brought by um, uniform law, 
and the diversity, which can be represented by private international law. And we have to identify under what conditions in uniform law a preferred option. In my view, there are two conditions where private international law is more beneficial than uniform law. First, if a law with a better fit to a specific case can be realized with low costs. Well, it means if precise and abundant information on applicable law is easily obtainable, and if a decision-making authority is rational and properly incentivized, or not biased, in other words, then the private international law could be a more appropriate option rather than uniform law. For instance, when similar cross-border cases repeatedly occur, and when the decision-making authority has a rich experience in dealing such cross-border cases, or when the decision-making authority is committed to the international community. How is the situation in the field of cultural property law. Information on applicable law may be difficult or costly to obtain. But sometimes the laws of the countries where um, totally different language from common um, languages in the international community is spoken. In such a case, to obtain the information of the law, applicable law be extremely difficult and costly. In addition, culture or cultural property is independently defined by each state. Therefore, the difficulty to understand applicable law could be also more complicated. And different from regular civil or commercial cases, the number of cases where the cultural properties is at stake is much smaller. Therefore, judges or attorneys are not necessarily familiar with the importance of the case. Also, often judges are educated in the context of domestic law so that the national courts may not pay due attention to the international community or international concern, global concern in other words. Well, from this viewpoint, the first um, condition that I propose does not exist in the field of intellectual culture, in cultural property law. So that's a first condition to prefer private international law doesn't hold. The second point, if the chosen law reaped greater benefits, private international law is a better option. If making an appropriate choice is difficult, and if the effect of choosing a law is in inconsequential, uniform law would be more desirable. For instance, when a cross-border relationship is so complex that obtaining precise information might be very difficult, or when private international law is still so underdeveloped 
that the result of its application is uncertain or unpredictable. When strong tensions exist among related parties, making an appropriate choice with small costs be very difficult. In the domain of cultural property law, disputes over the return of cultural property are often very complex. Complex not only in a sense of legal technicality, but also emotion. And private international rules specifically designed for cultural heritage seems to be still very underdeveloped. The rule, which is often applicable, let's say to apply lex re cite, is a rule of the property in general. And related to the complexity of the cases, tensions among the parties are usually very high. And the results of applying uh, Lex Ray Cite could depend on a lot of, let's say, um, coincidences. Therefore, let me go back to this point. The second condition also supports that the uniform law is a preferred option. So from my this short analysis from the viewpoint of costs and benefits analysis to adopt uniform law in the field of cultural property was an appropriate decision to enhance the global welfare. So going back to 1995, Unidroa made a right decision to adopt this uniform law to enhance the global welfare. So we who are living in international community now must be very happy with the decision at the time. In this context, I sincerely congratulate on the decision and efforts afterwards. Confirming that the uniform law is an appropriate tool from the viewpoint of cost and benefits analysis. I like to mention a few points for further development. First point, it has already mentioned that Unidraw Convention has now 48 member states. And probably it's, it's not necessary to say every person in Unidroa and, and also the international community related to cultural properties is aware that we need to have more member states. This can be justified from the viewpoint of network externality. The larger the size of the system is, the more, ben the, the more the benefits each player obtains. And it would attract more to join and it will create a virtual circle. This chart shows how and from where member states joined or states joined as a member states of this convention. I divided 25, these last 25 years into five groups in, for every five years. In the first year, in the first, um, let's say five years, this convention got 12 countries from three regions and then the following five years as well. But in the following 10 years from 2005, till 2015, um, the number was less. However, during the last five years, the convention has again, 12 member states. And very importantly, 
countries from Arab region, and then again, Asia Pacific, and Europe and Africa. So from the, 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 the coverage of member states is diversified. And if this tendency continues, and then the, extra, uh, ext the net network externality, externality um, could be further uh, strengthened. So um, needless to say, I would like to um, urge people working in, in this convention to try to get more member states that it would it would create a really um, an important uh, result. Next point is a slightly different. Um, a possible experimental analysis perhaps should be made in relation to outstanding universal value in the World Heritage Convention. I would like to cite an example. It is Naumburg Cathedral which in Germany. It was inscribed in 2018. This was not an easy nomination, but the end, the World Heritage Committee decided to inscribe it as a World Cultural Heritage Site, the cathedral only. Original nomination was cultural landscape in that area, but now the number cathedral only was inscribed. Interesting point is the emphasis of outstanding universal value, which World Heritage Committee adopted, focuses on the sculptures in the, in the cathedral. This famous Naumburg masters and their works in the cathedral are highly estimated. Suppose if a part of the sculptures is taken from the cathedral and put somewhere else, should we treat this part of the sculpture outside of the cathedral just as a sculpture or regular sculpture, or would it still represent outstanding universal value? If there's no relationship any longer between Naumburg Master's works in the cathedral and this part of the part of the sculpture, then how outstanding in value, outstanding universal value evaporated and where it is. And if it is still somehow related, then a question be raised if Rex Lacite, the law of the location should be applied or not. So the, this, let's say, relationship between movables and immovables and an, an outstanding universal value, and then the value of this sculpture, a part of the sculpture, this seems to be further elaborated. To my limited knowledge, this is not yet deeply analyzed. So if so, then a good question could be raised. Do we still have to follow regular private international law, i.e. Rex Lay City? And this comes, this is related to my last point. This is also a sort of experimental ideas. So we, we need more um, thought about it. The, the Professor Prot's article that I cited in, in the first slide, she suggested to use cultural heritage instead of cultural property. Because if we use the word cultural property, the complexities and some misunderstanding related to property laws, in general property laws, may be broad. So departing from that property law debate, she suggested to use cultural heritage law as an emerging field of law. And she compared 
this emerging field of law to environmental law. So in between, environmental law is an established field of law and cultural heritage law has its own significance. So this um, suggestion implies me that why don't we take a slightly different approach, i.e., instead of adopt, instead of following the private law approach, uh, property law approach, which which actually leads to the application of Rex Le Cite, heritage means inheritance. Heritage means inheritance. Would it be an idea to re-approach re from the inheritance law viewpoint. In inheritance, the private international law in, in, in inheritance focuses on the origin, either the nationality of the inherited person or the domicile of inherited person. It depends upon civil law or, or, or common law, but the focus seems to be on the origin, where the asset was, who owned the asset. On the other hand, Lex Le Cite focuses more the situation now, after the transfer of assets. So if we shift the paradigm from now to origin, then the the law of the origin or the, the country the country of or the law of the country of origin could be applicable and if the country of origin adopts unidraw convention then the court wherever it is would apply the unidraw convention irrespective of where the forum state is this is very um technical, legally technical, but private international law, very much private international law. But my feeling is that your UNIDROW could work together with Hague Conference on Private International Law and create a uniform private international law and combine with the UNIDROW Convention. Professor Prot also suggests in a paper that since UNESCO works for in, inter, public international law, for private law, the issues should be addressed to UNIDROA or Hague Conference on Private International Law. And UNIDROA has already properly worked. And next step might be a collaboration with Hague Conference on Private International Law. It could, again, enhance network externality and strengthen 995 convention. This said, I would like to conclude um, my um, short speech with many thanks and also happy birthday. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Professor Kono. It, people are clapping here. This is something that you cannot hear, I guess. <laughs> we cannot translate or uh, transfer these kind of uh, physical messages by web, unfortunately. But thanks a lot for your keynotes. Uh, we talk a lot, of no a lot of notes by hearing you. And uh, with this, I finish my job for the day. And uh, I, leave, I leave the floor to Professor Frigo, who's uh, a colleague of mine who really knows the matter. So finally, you get someone with real knowledge of the, of the subject matter. Malio, when, when you speak, you can. <laughs> Malio, you have the floor. <laughs>